All right. You guys ready to get started? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so my name is Brian. I'm a data scientist here at Duo Security. Uh, welcome to a joint event of Duo Tech Talks and the Austin Data Meetup. Um, we do these about once a month at our headquarters in Ann Arbor, and we're starting to do them here. Um, and uh, the Austin data organizers were kind enough to co-organize this with us. Um, and uh, I guess uh, I'm obligated to, to tell you that uh, we're hiring in pretty much all departments, including data science. Um, so uh, it's a great place. Come talk to me if you're interested. Um, and uh, any other announcements from anybody before we? No? OK, great. Um, sorry? Nothing? OK, I thought maybe you had something. All right. You can tell us about Duo. Please tell us about Duo. Oh, well, <laughs> since you asked. Um, so Duo is, uh, we like to say, the most loved company in security. Um, we do trusted access, which most of you probably know uh, as our uh, two-factor authentication product. Um, and uh, we have uh, other offerings as well that you may be less familiar with, all based around the idea of trusting the users and the endpoints that are accessing your applications. Um, so a lot of work around making security easy to use um, and kind of friendly and helping people get their jobs done um, as opposed to sort of being uh, an impediment to, to doing things. Um, so um, we're really fortunate tonight to have a special guest speaker. Um, Jay Jacobs came down from Minneapolis to be with us. Um, he was... Uh, Previously, the uh, the lead analyst on the Verizon uh, data breach investigations report, which is one of the most comprehensive um, sort of security data uh, reports in the industry. Um, he is now a senior data scientist at Bitsight. Uh, Bitsight Technologies does uh, security ratings for things like uh, cybersecurity insurance. Um, he is also one of the principals of the Scientia Institute, which does um, cybersecurity research. Um, so, uh, without further ado, Jay. Thank you. So before I get into it, uh, I'm curious what the makeup between data people and security people. So put yourself in one of the two buckets, but just from a show of hands, how many are more data-driven people and more security people? Both? Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Because I tailored it more to data people. so. Um, but there's certainly a lot of security stuff. So I, I do research in cybersecurity. And uh, when people think of that, when you say a security researcher, people generally think of this, right? You think of people catching hackers. You think, for some reason, of blue light. Uh, you think of you know, <coughs> detecting malware and this very, very uh, daily uh, event-driven kind of a thing. Uh, and that is absolutely not what I research at all. So my, my security looks more like this. This is more what researching in cybersecurity looks like for me. And to put this in perspective, I have two stories that I want to go back to from my early days that helped frame this problem of cybersecurity for me. So we've got this, we've got this challenge of hackers, all this trying to catch them, uh, the variety of ways that they can attack and the variety of ways we can defend. But here's a story. So I, I started out my career breaking systems, and then I moved over to trying to defend and build up systems and things like that, and I got into crypto. Because with cryptography, it, it is like, it's, it's a miracle. You can encrypt your data and essentially hand it over to your adversary, and it's perfectly safe, right? Math makes sure that that stuff is encrypted really well. So I got really into it. I thought it would solve all of our problems. And I was terribly wrong, but we'll get into that a little bit later. So I. I got into reviewing cryptographic products. And uh, I, there was a product I was supposed to review, and this is in a retail setting. And the, the vendor gave this to me, saying, this is for a key derivation system. There were uh, all these devices in a warehouse, and they were sending out keys to update. And the way they described their crypto is the key seed is used to mathematically select from a set of random numbers and is used to change those random numbers into new numbers guaranteed to be unique. Does anybody know what that means? Does anybody can, like, do you understand what's happening here? Uh, basically, they're saying it's a key derivation system. And you have no idea how good it is. So I asked them for source code. 
Can I have your source code, please? And it turns out that they do this key derivation one byte at a time. So for every byte coming in, they'll transform it and have a byte coming out. And if anybody knows anything about crypto in the key space that you're dealing with, you want a perfectly uniform distribution. You want every key to have the same probabilities every other key is showing up. So what I did for their, their system is I shoved every possible permutation in, and I looked at all the results. And this is what it looks like. Now, this is not a uniform distribution for those not up on their distributions. This is not uniform. Uh, this is a, a, a terrible thing. From a, a brute force perspective, you essentially start with all the even values, right? And you're cutting your space down into half of what it is. Um, and so this, from a crypto perspective, is terrible. It's broken. Now I'm going to go into the next story. The next story was uh, another project where they decided to roll their own cryptography. They had a requirement on a project to encrypt all the data on the network. Okay. And so uh, they decided to roll their own crypto, create their own encryption algorithm, which is always a terrible thing to do. Never do that. It never works out. And again, they gave me their source code. And this is their uh, encryption algorithm. The comment was from their source code. It actually said obfuscate data. For those who don't know, obfuscation is not encryption. Okay. And what they're doing here, if you can read the code, they're doing what's called a polyalphabetic cipher. So they've got this secret key in there. And they're taking what they need to encrypt, and they're shifting the alphabet. If you guys remember the old decoder rings, you'd shift that, turn that alphabet. They're doing that for every part of the key. And so this, uh, it's called the Caesar cipher, after Julius Caesar, who invented this and used it in the battlefield. Um, the polyalphabetic part was developed, I think, in the 12th century. Uh, this was broken in the 1700s in, in uh, France by a France method, uh, French mathematician. Uh, and I'm seeing it in 2006 in a retail environment. Um, and so the thing with this, though, it might, it might actually work if you had a really long key. right? This works through frequency analysis of the, the patterns. So if you have a really long key and you're able to, to update that and keep that going, you might be able to do this somewhat well. And so I keep looking, and here's the key, hard-coded at the beginning of the code. So again, from a crypto perspective, this is terrible. Like, this is broken crypto, right? But here's the question. How much should a company pay to fix this? How much should they dish out to go back into the code to open up a project to fix this problem? How much is it worth to them? I have no idea. I cannot answer that, that question. It is, it is very, very complex. And so the, the tools that people have in security now, I'm going to tell you the whole state of measurement and security looks like this. This is called a risk matrix. And it has two parts. How probable or likely is an attack? And how bad will it be when the attack occurs? And typically, they're qualitative like this. And people will put numbers, one through five, or maybe it's one, two, three, or high, medium, low, something like that. They put that on there. And for every event, so like for those two scenarios, they might say, it's not very probable, but boy, it's a high impact. you know. Or they, they, someone else might come along and be like, you know what? It's really going to happen often because this is really bad crypto. Or, you know, and you get these debates going on. And these are really, really ubiquitous. They are all over the place. And there's a lot of variations on this. Some will say probability, likelihood, instead of impact, you'll see consequence. You see all those things like that. And so this is the current state of measurement. Now, there's been a lot of research recently looking at these risk matrices. And uh, one of the leading researchers, Tony Cox, actually has a great paper on these. And he refers to them as worse than useless. <laughs> that these actually introduce errors and problems into risk analysis. As you start relying on this, you can create a whole bunch of problems with this. And this is everywhere. You go read some standard on how to do risk analysis, and they'll probably recommend this. So it's a challenge. And this is our current measuring stick. This is where we are now. So for the rest of my talk, this is what I want you to compare me to, OK? All right. So I'm going to swap over to my work at Verizon. Um, so what the, the data breach investigations report is, is it started out in 2008 uh, 
with one source of data, and it was Verizon. And they had an incident response team that would go out and for contract, under contract, respond to a breach and investigate what happened. And they would generate a report. So for the first year, looking at just the cases that Verizon worked. Second year, just the cases Verizon worked. The third year, the United States Secret Service shared their data, shared their caseload, because they were working a lot of cases with Verizon and things like that, good relationship. And then in 2011, we had three partners, and then I joined. And as you can see, I'm not saying causation, but there's certainly correlation after I joined. The number of uh, sources of data went up. And uh, every year, the, the cover of the report was always fun. You can see in 2014, 2015, uh, I was able to get some very data-driven covers on there. Uh, and so in 50 and 70 partners in those last two years that I participated, a whole bunch of really, really nice data. So when I joined, the, the report was a lot of what we call count and compare. So this is looking at these sources of data breach. Was it an internal employee or contractor? Was it an external, unauthenticated person? Or was it some kind of a partner, a trusted third party? Something like that. And all we're doing is counting and comparing here. And this is a 2012 report. And we do that for actions. And um, picking colors is really hard by the way. But, um, and so this is looking at actions, whether it had malware, hacking, social activity, uh, misuse, employee misuse, things like that, physical aspects. And again, we're just counting and comparing. And then in 2013, at a last minute addition into the report, we put this little post-it note. We realized that there were very, very distinct patterns in these breach data uh, that we were seeing. And so we just did a quick count. We had this POS smash and grab, point of sale. There were a lot of point of sale attacks that were essentially targeting small businesses. And they were breaking in, dropping malware on point of sale systems and exfiltrating data out of it. And it was like a repeated pattern on this point of sale. And then we had physical ATM. These are cash machines. The attacks, putting things, a face on there, something like that, to get at the, the information on your card and your account. And the last one is uh, APT. Uh, which is, you know, the advanced persistent threat, but we renamed it for a sense of humor. Uh, so, but these three patterns jumped out and essentially uh, took up about two-thirds of the confirmed data loss events in the data set. And that made me think, like, wait a minute, what else is in there? What other patterns are in that data set? And so I started trying to do some cluster analysis, some unsupervised learning, some cluster analysis. And this is one of the outcomes that I ended up with. This is a dendrogram. And essentially what I'm looking at is the attributes. We had a ton of attributes that we would look at for breaches. We would try to capture who is the actor, what is the motivation, what actions did they do, and we'd go down three levels into detail, what assets were involved, what attributes of these systems were affected, and so on and so forth. And so this is trying to take the actions and the actors and things like that and the assets involved and cluster on them. And you see very distinct patterns coming out of here. You see this ex-employee here coming back and going after their, their previous employer. Uh, opportunistic malware, just having simple malware infections, and so on and so forth. And these patterns came out of the data. And then taking these patterns, I started to try and visualize it. And using a technique called multidimensional scaling, which essentially is taking all of these uh, dimensions of this matched data and trying to put it in two dimensions, you can visualize it. And this is uh, espionage highlighted in purple. So this is state-affiliated espionage. You can see that the activities are clustering together. And there's two different clusters in there, meaning that there's probably two different styles of attack somehow. Uh, something like that. We can go on and look at employee misuse, which is in the upper right, right? Part of a larger cluster, so there's probably some shared techniques, but still unique up in that corner. Then you get things like point of sale attack, which is on the bottom and really spread out and very, very different. So as people were attacking point of sales, very, very different, yet had a lot of variety in it. And then you get things like web applications, which have, again, a couple of different patterns within web applications, uh, but very, very distinct. Right? And this type of thing, this is made on the cover in 2014. And uh, we're trying to show these patterns, and you can see they always wanted some sort of statistic on the cover to grab attention, right? It was 92%. 92% of all of our data could be described by these nine patterns. So we're getting better at trying to, trying to break out these patterns. Yep. Uh, can you just, can you sure. Uh, 
but we have to mic you because of the live streaming. Uh, so I was just curious, what features are you using in TD the cluster? This, so this cluster, uh, it, um, this is like another whole hour long talk yeah. about how this clustering went. But essentially what I did is I took the, the attributes, the, the tags that we had for each breach, and I would create one row for that, and I would say for all, everything that had this as a part of it, what, what are the other proportions of everything else? So like um, uh, malware that is a key logger, for example, which is typically used in these small point of sale things, for every event that had that key logger in there, how did, what did it have for the attacker motivations and what did it have for the other actions, what other assets were involved, what proportion of all the breaches had that asset? And so I created this matrix of that and that's what I was clustering on. So you'd see things that, like uh, key loggers and uh, exfiltration data of malware. Those two attributes became very closely clustered because they were in a lot of shared events. And so that's how these clusters were created. So, yep. And if you notice on this cover, if we zoom in, there's these little constellation things. Because every year when we're creating these, rep these covers, they want a whole bunch of different versions. And I did a version with uh, network diagrams because everybody loves network diagrams even though most people don't understand them. So I created that and the, the marketing team decided to put them over the other thing and so that's complements of the, the graphic design team. So but during this season that we're, working on the, that we're working on the report, there are a lot of late nights and so there was one night where I was dealing with these patterns and I decided to look how they broke out across industries. How did they break out? And at 2 a.m. I created this picture this is the actual picture I saved it up. And uh, I, I, this was so unbelievably pretty to me. You guys might not be seeing the same thing, but when I saw this at 2 a.m., I literally teared up. This is probably one of the most beautiful things I think I've ever seen. Because what we have in security is essentially top 20, right? Top 20 things that every company should do. This picture is saying absolutely not if you have a top 20, Different industries may want to attack that much, much differently. And out of that top 20, maybe there's some industries that only need five, something like that. And then we, we made it much, much prettier for the final version. And the, the colors now are by an industry. So you can see like the top line is accommodation, hotels and stuff. 75% of their attacks are just on their point of sale systems. And that is pretty much dominating everything in the hotel uh, industry. And things like that. You, then you get things like finance, for example, where it was just finance. You get web app attacks, and you get payment card skimmers and denial of service dominating in, in the uh, finance industry. And so this is, this is a first step, right? Trying to, trying to look at that risk matrix, remember back to that, as we talk about the probability side. The probability of something going on. This is very high level, but it's a first step, trying to say, what's more likely? And so like, uh, back to those crypto examples, maybe we could use that and look at this and say, what industry is that in? If it's in retail, does it have anything to do with point of sale, yes or no? If not, let's deprioritize that maybe, or something like that, right? So that's one half of that, that risk matrix. And this, by the way, is in the 2014 report, um, and it's been in versions of this, been in every report since. And so the reports are free to download from Verizon. So I want to go to the other side of that risk matrix and talk about losses. And we were just talking about this today, actually talking about how do we talk about losses and how do we, how do we um, try to estimate actual losses. And there's a lot of really bad data out there. And I really don't want to name names or anything, but I do want to focus on one particular source. right? And without any commentary, I just want to say that the way that one particular source, without naming, uh, they do survey data. So they go out and ask people, what did you lose or what do you expect to lose? And they included things in there like reputation damage. What would you estimate your loss is from reputation? Now, if a, a company tries to insure their reputation from an insurance company, in order to make a claim, they have to hire what's called a forensic accountant. Didn't even know that existed. But they would go in and do a whole bunch of really deep research trying to understand what the damaged reputation was. And here this survey is going out to like IT managers saying, hey, how much would you estimate from reputation damage? Gotcha. Second thing is, the goal of this research is to relate the number of records to the compromised losses. And lastly, it only looks at breaches between 10,000 and 100,000 records. 
Okay? And I'm going to call out one figure to talk about the quality of this research. So this is figure nine from, I think, the, um, two years ago. And look at the title here. This is the total cost of data breach by size. And look at the subtitle. Since we got a lot of data people here, you, you're going to have some expectations. Regression equals intercept times size of breach event times beta, where beta denotes the slope. I would have said coefficient, but let's not get nitpicky. So what do you guys expect to see in this figure? A regression line, a scatter plot? Yeah. I, I drew one, a log scale, absolutely. So this is my interpretation of what we'd want to see, right? You'd want to see records across the bottom, maybe, and how that relates to the total cost. And you'd have points in there, and then you'd have some sort of regression line, right? This is what you would expect to see. If you're trying to look at one continuous variable to another continuous variable, you'd want something like this. This is what's in there. I'm just going to step aside for a moment and let you guys soak this in. So I think what this is, I still haven't quite figured it out, but I think that the x-axis is the ranking by size to loss, and that's an Excel trend line. Someone click that box, I think. Does that make sense? So this particular graphic has absolutely no bearing in how they compute anything about their data. And actually what they do, rather than a regression, where you'd want to look at the effect of one variable to another, they describe it like this, per capita cost, even though per capita literally means per head, per capita in this case is talking about per record. Per capita cost is defined as the total cost of data breach divided by the size of the data breach, i.e. records. So what they do is they take how much, uh, how much it costs divided by the number of records and essentially come out with a cost per record. And this is the statistic that they will promote. Say, hey, this year the cost per record went up, went down, shifted over here. Look at how it's different across countries, so on and so forth. And I did a blog post on this in, in 2014. And I wrote up, this, there were two years that Ponemon uh, printed some tables in the back. I thought, oh, data, yeah, we can play with that. And so I did this post and I analyzed uh, the, the shortcomings of his method and I compared it to actual regression. I did regression with his, his data and found out it was a log-log relationship, put it on a log scale. And uh, I just put it out there. I did this in a weekend, uh, put it out there. And then it started showing up in academic papers. They're citing my blog post from this stuff. And here's the, the formula that I came out with. And uh, showed up in this one, Hype and Heavy Tales. Another one that we we're talking about today, examining the costs and causes of cyber incidents. Uh, my formula showed up in there that I came up with. And then in the 2015 data breach report, I actually got data from Net Diligence, a company that went out and grabbed a bunch of claims on insurance and was able to actually look at companies that were trying to get a claim on their insurance and said, here's our event, here's what we lost, here's what we're claiming, the damage. And so using that, I was able to create this. And I first actually computed, using his method, what is the cost per record on a breach. So this is looking at cost per record. So you've got cost per record here on a log scale and the number of records lost on a log scale. So if there is a cost per record, the trick here is to put a flat line here to describe this data. So where does that fly, flat line go? Right? It doesn't. Right? You cannot have a cost per record. And while we're on this slide, it, it's worthy to know, it's a little hard to see on the screen, but this band right here that is the records that Ponem will only look at, between 10,000 and 100,000 records. And I asked him why, because once I published this, uh, Larry Ponem and I had a bunch of words exchanged. Um, and I asked him why, and he said, things beyond that are weird. <laughs> so anybody remember statistics and why you would remove data that appears to be an outlier? Do you remember that, saying if it's weird, just toss it? You guys remember that? So this is the plot that I wish uh, Ponemon would produce. You've got records lost, and you've got dollar loss, right? And this is the plot. And here is the model that he had that year at $201 per record. You can see how well it describes the data. And then here on this data, I calculated 
Using his method, it's 58 cents per record. Nowhere near 201, but you can see how terrible that describes that data. And of course, it's because of these large breaches. And they have a very, very low cost per record. If I go back one, you can see these large breaches. This one has less than a penny per record in their claim. Uh, yeah, totally, yeah. So if you're gonna notify 100 people of a breach, typically notification is one of the bigger costs. If you're gonna notify 100 people, they're gonna charge you 15 to 20 bucks per record. If you're trying to notify 100 million, that cost is gonna come down considerably per person. Right, yeah. And when you're talking about 100 million, there's probably three to four records then per person, so actually you're notifying far less people probably. So, and so this record, this I, I came out with that statistic, and remember how I said they want a statistic on the cover? They tried to put this statistic on the cover, and I'm like, no, 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 this is a terrible number. Like that number has absolutely no meaning. And then they edited the first draft of the report, and that 58 cents within the margin, huge call out and stuff like that. And so I really regret coming up with that 58 cents. And if you search for this, you search for Verizon cost per record, you will find articles saying Verizon says 58 cents per record, you know? And it's terrible, terrible stuff. But this is the overall relationship, right? It is not a linear relationship as, as we were talking about economies of scale, right? And the problem, I have a problem with this particular type of research that we're doing because it's very popular. I couldn't go into uh, the value of R squared and you know all the things that you would normally talk about with really nice regression models. So I was doing things like this, like, hey, look, it's not linear, you know, trying to keep it simple. Um, and so this is just saying, you know, like you get a, a large impact on the smaller ones, and then it sort of flattens out a little bit. And this is the amount of uncertainty. So just taking the number of records was not a great model overall. There was so much uncertainty. And this is just the uncertainty in the average, right? The actual individual loss was astronomical. So this is a first step talking about impact. So we talked a little bit about probability, a little bit about impact. And now I'm gonna take a, a little offshoot. And I'm gonna talk about measuring security and maturity. In order to do this, I wanna talk about what, what I do from a day job uh, real quick. And, and Brian mentioned this, but um, try to, what BitSight does is that they produce a security rating for a company. And so if you're doing things like a merger and acquisition, or if you're just dealing with a third party, uh, or your insurance company figuring out if you want to insure someone, right now what companies are doing are long questionnaires, or they go on site and do a site visit. A uh, lot of work goes into that. And so this is just a way to try and get data. Uh, BitSight has a huge data collection program, uh, buys a whole bunch of data sources and all that stuff like that. And using that data, they try to understand, I should say we, we try to understand uh, a, a company's maturity, a company's security ability from the data that we're able to grab. And I wanna go into that a little bit because it's, it's kind of interesting. This is getting a little bit away from the probability and impact side, but this gets really, really interesting. So here are six variables that I collected on 37,000 organizations, over three billion measurements, okay? And so I wanna go through these variables. Uh, in the upper left, we've got botnet infections per employee. So uh, there's a really large sinkhole infrastructure that BitSight owns. And what that is, when somebody, when a botnet hits a machine, when you get a botnet on a machine, uh, malware, it tries to phone home. And so what these sinkhole infrastructures try to do is try to get in that link when it says, hey, where do I go to phone home? We try to get in that chain and say, oh, phone over here, right? And it phones into the, the, the sinkhole infrastructure. And so once it does that, we're able to, to prevent them from actually communicating with the main person that they want to communicate and things like that. And we sinkhole it. And, but we're able to record that and say, oh, where did this come from? Oh, it came from that company, right? And so we're able to see how many botnet infections companies have by doing this. And so this is normalized by the number of employees. And what's really cool, this is really pretty, right? I mean, just from a distribution standpoint, it's not totally random. There's not chaos going on there. There's a really nice rise and fall to it. Uh, the next one is looking at peer-to-peer -peer file shares. Uh, for those who don't know, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing is a, a protocol, or maybe it's a set of protocols. This is mainly looking at BitTorrent, um, meant to exchange files peer-to-peer. -peer. And because it's peer-to-peer -peer without a central authority, you get a lot of copyrighted material, movies, video games, applications. You can get every Microsoft product that you'd want 
off of peer-to-peer -peer file shares, and you can also get a ton of viruses because it's uncontrolled. Right? We did a study where we found about 40% of the applications and games contain malware on the peer-to-peer -peer network, which is a really high proportion. And also in this, in this particular study, we showed that there's a huge correlation between use of peer-to-peer -peer and the malware infections that we're able to observe. But again, this is per employee, and you see a nice rise and a nice fall, things like that. And so it's a, a very pretty, pretty distribution. The next one is looking at TLS services. And this is uh, the percentage of encrypted services that a company offers that is misconfigured somehow. Uh, so you can see like that 100%, there's a little spike on the right there. That means that there's a company that 100% of their services had some kind of misconfiguration problem. And these are meant to negotiate encryption algorithms. And so you could, a company could use outdated ciphers, could use old protocols as they negotiated, things like that. And so this is an interesting distribution. There's probably at least two sub-patterns going on. There's some companies that are totally bad and some that are totally good. And then you get sort of this triangle distribution of it going up and dropping off. Uh, the next one is somewhat related in the lower left here. This is SSL certificates uh, and the percentage that they have uh, bad again. And you can see a really tall spike for 100% bad certificates. So this might be expired certificates. Maybe it's a weak signing algorithm weak key in there or something like that, some sort of problem in that certificate. Uh, and the one in the bottom middle is what we call reasonable services. These are all encrypted services. So just looking at what proportion of your services are encrypted, which is, by all security standards, a good thing. And that's the only really good variable in here. The rest are, are generally bad. And then one on the bottom right are what we call risky services. These are all the services that all the security people would be like, no, 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 don't open that. Right, don't, don't put that one to the internet. It's Telnet, FTP, POP3, things like that. SMB shares, which just helped the uh, re recent ran ransomware spread. Uh, and so these are things that, that you wouldn't want to see. And you can see most companies don't have a lot of them. It sort of starts low, 5%, and drops off from there. And then you get that little peak at the end where 100% of services from some companies are unencrypted. So we can take this type of distribution and look at some companies who have had a breach. This is a company, the red lines depict where one particular company fell in these distributions. So this is a company that had a web application breach. It was widely talked about, publicized. Uh, you can see they had a whole bunch of botnet infections in here, way above average, more than one per person. Uh, and this is over a 12-month period. And they had a whole bunch of peer-to-peer -peer file share going on. And of course, these two are going to be correlated. And the, the TLS services, eh, not, not real good. You know, probably what, about two thirds had some kind of an issue on them. Uh, their certificates were terrible. Almost 100% had some kind of flaw on them. Uh, the reasonable services, very low, but also very low risky services. So this, I think this particular company did not have a very good rating overall. Uh, and so this type of thing wasn't a huge surprise as we look at their data. But here's another one. Here's an internal database compromise company that Attacker actually got into their internal network and compromised an internal database. And you can see it's a little bit better. They didn't have any peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Their, their, certificate, their services in the upper right, not so good. A little better than the last company on certificates. Um, and they've got a lot of risky services, though. I mean, relatively speaking, about one in four of their services were unencrypted, mm -hmm. passwords going in the clear kind of a thing. So I mean, there's, there's give and take here, and there's things like that, but given this data, we essentially created uh, a model to try and understand the influence, the effect of these variables on the botnet infections. This is, we treated that as an outcome. And we did that because breaches are really, really infrequent. It's a really, really unbalanced data set if you try to go to breaches. But botnets, we had much, much more data. And so we used that as an indicator of badness. And the model looks like this, the output. And so this is just output from a, a regression uh, and I, I think this is a really interesting way to look at the coefficients in a regression. So essentially, zero is that dotted line there. And so we had a variable in there for blocking peer-to-peer. -peer. And if a, if a company blocks peer-to-peer, -peer, you can see it drops uh, negative five. So almost six, I think it's 6%. It was a log, log on there. Here's the, the formula. Um, and so, but the other things, the things that you would expect to be bad contribute to more botnet infections. So the peer-to-peer -peer file shares, the bad service configurations, certificate management, and the unencrypted services all contributed 
to more malware. And then companies with encrypted services decreased the amount of malware. And so this is just something that we put out there, some research we did, trying to figure out what is the significance of these variables? How do these contribute, right? And this is a challenge in security as we try to figure out what are companies doing that's working? This is the approach that we, we decided to take to try and do that. Try and look at these variables and figure out how are they contributing. And then just as a, a simple sort of afterthought in the report, we looked at how did botnet activity and peer-to-peer -peer, uh, compare to breaches? And what we found is that 68% of breached organizations had botnet activity, while only 32% of non-breached organizations did. So you can see quite a bit of a slant towards uh, those with botnet activity much more likely to have uh, breach infection or um, botnet infections. And then on peer-to-peer, -peer, same type of story. Those who had breaches also had a, a large proportion of peer-to-peer um, -peer activity on their network. And so this gets to, you know, using botnet instead of breaches, we can create a more robust model, but we're seeing a, a relationship between botnets and breaches, so as a proxy variable. So this is, uh, now we're gonna get into the really fun part. So this is a challenge that, that I had really recently at work, so this is a, a late addition. So the question is, no, seriously, what is the probability of a breach, right? What is the probability? Um, when I started at BitSight, one of the first things I did is I kicked up a program to capture breach data. Um, they were already doing it, but essentially I brought in someone full time to, to do this data collection because that's a measuring stick, right? That is a negative outcome. When you talk about security, what is security? Security is a lack of loss, right? So if we can track these loss events, we could start to use that as a measuring stick and go from there. And so what I did is I, I did a couple of things. So we've got this challenge where we need to understand, are we doing better, right? You can look at a model, you can evaluate it in multiple different ways, but the real thing is we want to compare it against something, right? And in statistics, you'll talk about the null model. And so I created a, a null model, which essentially, the best null model, by the way, what's really great about the breach problem is you can say, nobody will be breached and you're like 97% accurate. Right, so I mean like you can, if you just talk about accuracy of a classifier, you're starting at 97% by just saying nobody's breached. Uh, so you have to do better than that, right? And that's because of the class imbalance. So what I actually did for the null model here, this null model, is I took the, in this case, we have just over 70,000 companies in this study and just under 2,000 breaches and I, I basically said, given that probability, I think it was about 3% probability, something like that. If we said everybody has a 3% probability of being breached, what do the measurement looks like? So we've got the AUC, of the uh, uh, receiving operating curve there, the, the rock curve. And the last one was the cross entropy loss or log loss. Um, log loss, trying to, tr what log loss does that I, that I like is that you're able to take the probability and look to what actually that, um, the distance from what you expect. So the cross entropy, I think, is a much better measurement of model performance. But you can see in the null model, we get about 0.11. And then as we go through these models, um, I did four models, and models one and two are very, very similar, because I started with a simple model here, and then there are a few people uh, that I was working with that said, throw these variables in, they must be important, right? So I leave that in there uh, for them, even though we're not seeing much improvement. And then I started doing some, some serious feature engineering, getting down into here. Model four is a, a pretty good improvement. And if we look at this, this is uh, output from cross-validation, repeated cross-validation. So I'm doing five folds, uh, repeating five times. And these are the, the measurements. So like on model four, this is just a box plot. The median is, is what I was showing in the previous slide. But you see there's variation there depending on how those folds are split up and things like that. So trying to measure the model performance. Now I'm talking about these four, but I actually, um, I created this plot for, for people at work just saying, we're trying a lot of models here, right? And we're doing a lot of things. And like this, it seems like I started at the top and I went down and I kept on getting better. It's not the case at all, right? I started up here and I would get down here and I'd be like, hey, what if I threw that in? And I'm gonna back up here. No, no, I'll take those out. What if I put that in and I get down here? So I'm jumping all over the place. It just looks like I was smart and just kept on improving. Not the case. So, but if I go back to those four models, we can talk about overall improvement, right, over the null model, over just saying flat probability. 
So with that model one, a simple model, we're getting already 6% improvement over that. As we get to model four, we're over 10% on, on there. And so what I'm doing, I'm doing a, a simple random forest here, but I did downsampling, meaning like I would balance out that data set. So it just ha had just under 2,000 breaches. I would, after I did the training and test split, I would then balance it out to the same number of unbreached entities. And this is a hard problem because essentially we only have positive only data. We only know if a company has been breached because it's been a headline, a FOIA request, somehow we got data about this company being breached. But the other companies, we just don't know, right? Did they have a breach and didn't report it? Did we not capture it? Uh, did they have it and slipped it under their insurance or something? Uh, we have no idea. So really, all we know is if a company was breached because we've got evidence. The other ones, we don't actually know. So we're playing around with like one class SVMs and things like that. But this is a, a straight random forest. But because we're downsampling like that and we're sort of ar artificially balancing the classes, the output from a random forest is between zero and one, having nothing to do with proba <laughs> probability. <coughs> so in order to do that, we need to calibrate the probability. And this is the output from the calibrated probability. And so the purpose of calibration is to essentially say, uh, we've got the predicted probability in the out on the bottom here, and we're doing binning. So like between 14 and 16% predicted probability, we expect on average about 15% of those we say that should be breached to actually be breached, right? And so this is very tangible feedback. When we say 10% probability of being breached, we expect about 10% of those in our holdout data set to be breached. And that's what we're seeing here. But the other cool thing is, in very simple models, the, the probability is compressed, right? It's not, it's not the full range. And so as we build better models, we're getting better differentiation. And we're still maintaining that calibrated uh, probability in there. And so uh, actually what's funny is that I created this, and this, I do all my stuff in R, and I set the limits, and then I realized I was chopping off a data point, and there's a data point that goes up here uh, that got chopped off, so the last data point did not look favorable, and I swear it's totally an accident that I chopped it off. <laughs> totally an accident. So, but there's, uh, so this is just a cool thing to look at and talk about calibrating the probability. So this is just a way to say when we say 10% or whatever, we mean it, right? We've got evidence saying 10% means 10%. Now there's all sorts of cave caveats about the source of, of data that we're using, the bias and breach data, all these things. But this is way better than high, medium, low, right? I mean, remember, this is what we're comparing against. And then a really funny thing, so in, in insurance, there's a multitude of different ways that insurance companies will create insurance policies, and some will do a flat rate. And so they want to know, do we insure the company or not? Other companies may want to adjust a premium, so they may want to say, are they more risky or less risky, things like that. So this is called a precision recall curve, for those who don't know. And so the precision, essentially, these are really confusing. And I'm going to sound like really smart because I'm just going to read it off the screen. But I always have to look up what these mean, right? And there's uh, Wikipedia has a really nice diagram of these trying to dis discern between precision and recall. So but precision, the, the y-axis on these, is the proportion of these of predicted, those predicted to experience a breach who actually experience a breach, right? So it's the true positive over the true positive plus the false positives. Recall is the proportion of breached entities who are correctly predicted. So it's a little bit flipped around, right? And so you create these curves and you can see essentially what you want on the curve. If you have a great model, this curve is gonna be up here. It's gonna go up like that. Um, and obviously we don't have that, right? We've got a little bit further away from that upper right corner. But you can see as the models get better, uh, we're getting more space under that curve. And you can do a, a use the area under the curve for this as well, which is another metric to use. But the other thing is we've got that cutoff, that rainbow chart that says, if we say 10% is our cutoff, you can look at 10% as like a green, I think. You can see where green is on these things and see where that does for precision and recall. And so one thing to do on here is what's called the F measure, or F1 measure, depending on the source you're looking at. And what this does is it, it tries to optimize the relationship between precision and recall. And so this is looking at the, the four different models and where does the 
optimum come up. And um, you can tweak that, that measure to say to you if you want more precision. In other words, like uh, if you want to be more accurate in your prediction, or do you want to get more breaches correct, which is a similar thing, but subtle. Um, and it hurts my brain to think about it. So but what this is essentially, using these curves, we can set this. And this is just setting the two even. Let's just assume that we want the same amount of precision and recall. And so using this, we're optimizing where that cutoff should be. And then from that, we can create what's called a confusion matrix. I think most people are familiar with this who have uh, worked with machine learning. So we've got the confusion matrix from the different models. And essentially, if we just focus on the, the worst to the best, you can see that what this is doing is we're getting our, our true positives. The amount that we say are going to be breached, that are breached, goes way up, 288 to 530, which is a lot when there's not a lot of breaches. Right? And those that we say are not going to be breached that are breached went down as well. So these are the ones that we're wrong about. And so that's going down. And now we can, we can flip that around as well and, and focus on the, the bottom side. And so this is really great for insurance companies. Yep. Values are here is a continuous value. How do you classify these values into those binary rock or AUC so, to measure? So, yeah, so essentially the output for my model is a probability, a continuous variable. And so what this is trying to do is to say, where do we actually, we're trying to get to a binary vari variable of yes, we should insure them, or yes, we should do business, or yes, we should buy that company, or no, we shouldn't. So we're taking that, that continuous probability and trying to figure out where do we put that line. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's what the precision recall is doing. Yeah. In this one can, versus the last one. So you can see like on this one, on the good model here, the cutoff is at 31%. And so the, the um, precision is lower uh, than this one. Where now it's at 15%, so we're over here and we're up higher in there. So the recall goes down, but the precision goes up. So the, the precision and the recall, they are always dependent on the class, like the class you define, which is positive for you. Uh, breach. Okay. Yeah. So when we say true, you're predicting true, you're predicting breach. You should probably lay breach and no breach, breach and no breach. But so this is what we're predicting. So we're saying uh, it, at these cutoffs, Right at a cutoff of 15% in the good model, we're saying we're saying these are going to be breached. About 1,400 are going to be breached. Out of those 1,400, 335 were actually breached. Okay. And now, what's challenging though in security is that like the other 1,000 may really suck at security. Like they they you know might be out there with their kimono completely open, but they haven't been breached yet. Right? And so like still, like, do you still want to insure them? Even though they didn't experience a breach, not in the data set and things like that. So this, it's a tough challenge, right? But from an insurance perspective, like, that's, that's what they care about. Like, did they have a claim or not? Like, we don't really care how bad they are. We just want to know if, they have, if they're going to have a claim. So they really care about that accuracy. So but in this one, what's really cool from an insurance perspective is that if you look at the top line, 326 to 335, that's the number of, of uh, claims. Even this whole line is the number of claims. And that didn't shift much in this model, right, between these two different models. But the bottom line, this is where essentially they're, they're expanding what they call their book of business. They're expanding the companies that they can insure, but not incurring any more risk in the top line. And that's huge. Like they're obviously, well, wait a minute, you can get more money and have like no additional risk? Let's do that, you know. So, um, so this is what I've been working on lately, trying, trying to talk about this. Um, I actually get to work with a lot of insurance actuarials, talk about how they're modeling, how they're pricing things, uh, really fun stuff. So back, uh, side story, back when I started trying to, trying to understand risk and security, people would say like, oh man, if we only had actuarial quality data. Have you guys ever heard this? If we only had actuarial quality data, we could do risk analysis really good. So I've had a chance to talk to actuarials and it's like, what is actuarial quality data? And they're like, what? I don't know what that is. Um, so, but there, there is no such thing. There's data and then that's it. Uh, so, 
Um, so yeah, this, this is kind of fun to be playing around with this. And there's, this is very young work. Uh, and the next section I'm going to go into is even younger work. Like this is yesterday, OK? So this is, this is where we're heading. So if I go back to those, that original problem that I talked about, the two problems of crypto, how can we talk about the, the probability of an event and the, the amount of losses? How do we combine those two things without a risk matrix? Right? How do we replace that? And the, the answer is something that's been in insurance for a long time. It's called a loss exceedance curve. And essentially, you've got the same, the same axes as the risk matrix. You've got some sort of probability and some sort of a loss. But the probability here means the probability of you exceeding some loss. Okay? And if you Google loss exceedance curve, there's tons of examples out there. So this is looking at uh, nitrate loss, right? the probability of uh, exceeding some amount of nitrate loss. And there's different treatments in here and things like that. Um, here's another one. A lot of time in uh, insurance, I talk about return period. And what that means is, like, you guys have heard of, like, a 1 in 100 year flood, 1 in a 50 year earthquake, things like that. All that's saying is, like, a 1 in 100 year flood is, like, a 1% uh, chance of occurring. That's all it means on an annual basis. But they talk about it in terms of this return periods because then they don't get percentages and it's a lot easier for people to think about. And it's somewhat intuitive to hear about a 1 in 100 year flood. Um, and so this is looking, I don't even know what that one is showing. But this one is interesting because there's companies down here that I get to work with right now. But they're, they're looking at essentially the Florida uh, residential portfolio and the amount of return period for some event, um, probably a hurricane or something, and the amount of losses in billions. So like for a one in a hundred year event, they're estimating between five and 40, 50 percent, something like 50 billion dollars. So it's saying like, there's a 1% chance that your losses this year are going to exceed X dollars. Exceed, right? So you're setting that lower threshold. So that's what a loss exceedance curve is. Now we, we have, I have, uh, some notion of probability, right? And we've got loss distributions. Now these loss distributions are really iffy, right? Uh, depending on the source of data, this is actually from uh, a company working in insurance that uses court cases and looks at uh, company filings and court cases to try and deduce loss from these events. And so I've got two things here. The blue is the actual data. Red is the distribution I fit to it. So once I fit a distribution, then I can start to sample from it and get data that was not in the original distribution. So from that, if we take 100 companies, for example, and say you're a company, you've got 100 different partners that you're sharing data with, you're giving them access into your network, things like that, those companies or insurance portfolio or something, this is what their loss distribution uh, looks like, their loss exceedance curve. Um, and so you'll see some of these, and some of them that are actually being created in cyber will go down to like one in a thousand, one in five thousand years. Like that is insane. The accuracy is so bad, you really don't want to go much further than this. Right? There's a one percent probability of occurring. So but this is just taking, you know, if I take this loss distribution, and the probability, and I combine them, we get this line. Now remember I said there's a lot of uncertainty in that loss data. So what I did is I took that fit distribution, I just perturbed it a little bit. Just minor amounts to see how much of that fit distribution affected it. And we're seeing some crazy stuff down here. Right, we're going from 10 million to over 1 billion. Right, that is a very tough sell to insurance companies to be like, eh, 10 million to over a billion, somewhere in there. Right, that, that is not something that they like to, uh, to hear. Um, so we have to keep that in mind as we're, as we're talking about this loss data. And so what the, the really fun thing that I tried to do then is to start to just get a temperature, just you know, wet finger in the wind process of what does a single, single organization look like from this loss exceedance curve. So if you're working at a company and you've got really good or really bad security, this is what a loss distribution is, is generally going to look like, given this loss information. Right? So if you're at a 3% um, three probability of breach, which a fair number of companies are, it was very heavy to the left in that probability distribution. You know, you've got a 1% chance of exceeding a million dollars, um, which is pretty good. I mean, like, that's, that's not bad. 
But if you're a, a very poor performing company, typically these are larger organizations with a really large footprint. They'll have a lot of events. Like Google, I think, has like, you know, they're in the news for breaches like every other month, it seems like, every month. So I mean, it's hard to be a large organization not be in the news for breaches and stuff like that. But like, this is the loss distribution. So one every 10 years, they're going to start to see losses like this that are falling in this curve. They're going to exceed that amount, right? Once every 20 years, which is 5% chance uh, of exceeding 2 million, right? And so this is how we can start to talk about uh, risk and start to, to start to tackle these problems. Yep. So um, thank you for this. I think it's really interesting. And I guess my question is related to the probabilities like uh, of the event occurring. So things like statistically, like kind of continue, or I guess I'd say consistently statistically um, uh, similar events like hurricanes or something are easy to predict. But for example, we have uh, events like WannaCry or something where all of a sudden an event happens and now a huge swath of the population is hit simultaneously. So yeah. how do you account for a percentage of something that is stochastic, but yet may be extremely widely spread out? Great question. That's actually really insightful, because in insurance companies, to be honest, they, they, they don't care about the single event. Like, they can insure a single company, they can insure several companies, and they've got, they're starting to get a feel for the, the amount of claims that they're going to get. What they really care about is the aggregated risk, and that's what they talk about, this, this egg risk or aggregated risk. And that's like uh, the Dyne attack that happened as well, or some widespread malware outbreak like with WannaCry. Um, or, you know, like, so uh, Dyne is an example where it's a shared service provider. And, like, everyone brings up AWS. Hey, if AWS goes down, how many insurance claims are we going to see for business interruption? Right? And this is what they really care about. And so what it does to the curve, um, it's, it's super interesting. I was, I was simulating this, just saying, like, if we have this event, and they're relatively rare. Like they're actually, you get about, I don't know, half dozen per year that qualify as an aggregated event, but they're somewhat limited. You know, so like Dyne, for example, Dyne was like four to five hours, I think, of a DDoS attack, and most insurance policies did not kick in. They've got some sort of threshold, like your business has to be down for more than eight hours before we pay a dime. So like insurance companies, that didn't really hit them at all. Um, but so, something like WannaCry, where you get business interruption, you get things that they actually have to pay out, they've got recovery time, costs like that. So what you see is that this curve does nothing until you get to this extreme case. So maybe it's like a one in a 50 year event or something like that, and all of a sudden this curve goes whoom, and it shoots off to the right. And this is why insurance companies get freaked out about it, because if they hit that one event, you know, like, they talk about Hurricane Andrew. Does anybody remember Hurricane Andrew? This was a huge deal in the insurance industry, and this kicked off a whole industry called cat modeling, catastrophe modeling. And so th I think there was, like, nine insurance companies that became insolvent because of Hurricane Andrew, because of this aggregated risk. Um, Reinsurers? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a, a really interesting event in the insurance industry. Um, and so what they say is that we haven't had that event yet in cyber. When we talk about security, we have not had our Hurricane Andrew yet. But the question is, will we? And what will it look like? And how bad is it? Yeah. Yes, you're here. Thank you so much, Jay, for the presentation. So I'm more so on the security side of this meetup. Mm -hmm. And as a university student majoring in cybersecurity, I have one key question. Okay. So do you think, in your opinion as a professional and subject matter expert, not subject matter expert, do you think that data science will help people who do forensics like pretty much help with their attribution when trying to figure out who's really the cause or the blame of certain like cyber events like on the APT level? Uh, yeah. <laughs> give me some more. Give me some more. <laughs> So I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of biased, but I think anytime we're trying to learn from, from data that we've collected, you know, an attribution is certainly a problem of learning from data that we've collected. Um, I think that machine learning and data science will absolutely help in that problem. Now, attribution is really hard, right? And we had this problem at Verizon because we were trying to attribute to the actor who was doing it 
um, and we're trying to capture information on the actor, and attribution became extremely hard to the point where most of them were coming up as unknown, right? Um, we, could, we could tell some things about motivation, but, but yeah, I think, I think it will help. Because, um, I mean, if you think about how many variables go into an attack, um, you know, they're, the tools that they're using, the malware that they're using, and all the information that comes in malware, you know, how was it compiled, what system was it compiled on. Um, and even that is starting to be used to, to distract uh, researchers because it says, oh, this was encrypted on a machine that has the Russian language as a default. Well, you know, like the attacker's like, hey, you know what, I'm going to set this to Russian default and then we compile it. Um, so stuff like that, I mean, it becomes very, very difficult. But when you have all of these different signals, essentially, in the attack, I think machine learning is going to be much, much better than people at getting to some sort of attribution. Now, whether the, it's going to be helpful, I don't know. But I do think, because we, we always have to compare it to what we have now. And what we have now is people looking at it being like, well, I see this, and I see this, and I see that. I think it's X, right? I, th I think it's China. I think it's this. And, and so that's what we have to compare against. And I think machine learning and stuff like that should be able to improve on that. But that's just, you know, that's my hope and my bias. So, yeah. So, and so this, this is where we sort of ended up. Right? We've got a loss exceedance curve. But I, I just want to end on one slide just to remind people of where we are. Right? This is where we are. When we try to talk about should a company spend money to fix something, this is what they're using currently. Right? So I think we've got a lot of opportunity to improve. We've got a lot of things that, that um, this type of work uh, that I'm trying to do here hopefully will lead to a better understanding of, of security in general. So, and with that, I'll open it up for any questions that you have. More questions? I know we got some already. I guess this goes on to what he was saying, but uh, uh, on TV, there's been a lot of Watson ads, or at least one particular one, hitting right towards this, where the, the very stern lady comes in saying, we have all these threats, and Watson says, I've got it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Uh, so how far are we from that, or, uh, and, and, and is, I guess, using big data as a generic term, yeah. uh, accumulating this type of information, I guess, more methodically? Yeah. Um, again, I mean, like, comparing it to what we have, right? Like, how good are we capturing these people, these attackers now, uh, and then, if you spend the money to get Watson in your environment, how good is Watson at, at doing the same thing, right? And um, I, I won't comment on Watson, but uh, I think in general, I think that we're going to get better. I mean, we're, we have to get better, right? Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, the, there's a, a whole field uh, or sort of like sub-industry of security automation and orchestration yeah. um, that uh, isn't necessarily using machine learning right now, but uh, Right, but uh, yeah. it, it seems to me like that's you know that's kind of laying the groundwork for you know pl a place where you could use machine learning to, yeah. to to sort of do this sort of incident response. Yeah, and there, there are several companies starting up that are trying to figure out what what in a SOC in the security operations center what in there can be automated, right? And that's. But I think what you've been saying is so helpful for all of that because of you're you're an al you're analyzing the causes. Mm -hmm. and how you can actually subdivide this and, and, and get a handle on it. And, and just going with raw big data without having a categorization scheme is really yeah. meaningless. Yep, thank you. Over there. Um, so th it seemed like a lot of the factors you broke down were kind of long-standing issues at a business. To what degree yeah. does a business's sophistication with rapid response actually adjust their risk curve, or how you characterize yeah. how big the event could be? Good question. I have no idea, because I haven't seen any data. Um, the work that I did for the DBIR and Impact, that was like the leading thought in my head that, you know, we're looking at how does number of records uh, affect the actual impact. But I would guess, you know, just from what I've seen, like if a company has a lawyer on retainer, and a PR firm on retainer to respond to a breach, their impact could be vastly different, or rapid response, right? Their, their DFIR team 
Uh, do they have one on uh, in, internal? Do they have someone on contract? Are they ready to go if they have an event? And my guess is that there's those variables would affect the actual impact and losses way more than just the number of records, I think. But I, I haven't seen any data on that, so I, I'd love to. If you have anything, I'd love to work with you on it. Um, do you think that these kinds of analyses will affect how um, attackers try to breach systems? Like, do you think that there's kind of a risk of like, yeah. when you go out and collect all this data and make all these predictive models, well, other people might see that too and they might shift their yeah. strategy and then all of a sudden your data isn't yeah. useful anymore? Man, I, I hope so. I hope the work we're doing will shift the way that they have to attack. I mean, that is really the goal, right? I mean, like. What we saw, like there's there was that huge trend in point of sale attacks, and like largely they had the same tactics for like three, four years in a row, and it was really boring to go through these cases because it was like, ah, oh, they had an open remote administration service, they brute force password got it and dropped malware. You know, it's like, ah, oh, that's so boring. You know, and oh, here's 300 more, right? Um, and it was year after year, and so like if we could just get in and disrupt that. You know, from what I've seen, attackers are incredibly lazy like everybody else. They're not going to change until they have to, right? So if we can do some work and make them shift their tactics, even if, like, we're putting stuff out there and saying, you know, like, but things they can't change. Like, if they want to get after credit card information, they're going to hit hospitality. They're going to hit retail. Um, and so, I mean, they're not going to be able to go after a manufacturing company to get a whole bunch of credit cards, right? That's, like, we're not going to lose anything by saying, they need to focus on their point of sale, right? The, the attackers know that, we know that. Let's have retail uh, focus on that as well. Um, so yeah, but I, yeah, I, I would hope that we can do things that will make them shift. Now, if we're putting out information that is actually helping them, that's a slightly different case, right? We're gonna, we have to try to, we tried to walk that line a lot in the DBIR. Um, like we did, a, we got a really couple of rich data sets on phishing emails and phishing attacks. And we could go in and we started to look at what makes for a successful phishing attack. And we couldn't publish that, of course, right? Because it, it's very bad to put out there, hey, here's how you totally trick people into clicking. You do this, this, this. And um, so that type of stuff. Like, we, we have to walk that line somehow. But at the same time, we want to get information out there to help people understand where to focus, where priorities lie, and stuff like that. And I think we are just completely at, like, the, the birth of this. This is like an infant. Uh, stage of this whole type of research. I think there's a whole bunch more room to grow here. All right. Um, well, if there aren't any more questions, then uh, thank everybody for coming out, and uh, let's thank Jay one more time. Thank you. And I'll be around, too, if you have more questions. Yeah, feel free to stick around for a bit. And